Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Stephen Bone from Crimson Medical Solutions. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this one because me and Stephen actually connected before. We had an opportunity to talk a little bit about what he's doing. I think it's super, super innovative. But before we get into that, Stephen, introduce yourself. Who is Stephen? Where are you calling in from? Thanks, Gabriel. Yeah, I'm calling in out of Spokane, Washington. I'm originally from the west side of Washington and then went to Washington State University for bioengineering, which is where we started a nursing focused startup out of college. So we've been pursuing that for the last few years up here in Spokane, where we came up here for an incubator and uh, kind of most recent milestone for what we're doing is uh, starting our first clinical trial here in the last month. I love it. In fact, you mentioned that uh, it's snowing up in Spokane right now. Yep, snowing. It's kind of uh, the joke in Spokane is uh, second winter. So we usually have kind of the first wave and then people are like, oh my God, it's spring. I'm so excited. Um, but yeah, second winter appears to be here because there's about an inch of snow on the ground right now. Oh man, that's too funny. Second winter, that's the first time I've heard of that. We have, see, we always tell people here in Oregon, we have the rain season and then we have August. That's pretty much, that's pretty much all we have over here. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, so pretty similar on the west side of Washington. It's just, yeah, I'm like, telling you, the west coast. In fact, folks, if you have not been out to the Pacific Northwest, we highly invite you to come out and visit. It's beautiful. It's green. It's it's really plush. It's it's gorgeous out here. I can't, I can't lie. So, Stephen, let's let's talk a little bit about the uh, Crimson Medical Solution. But before we get into that, I kind of want to talk about you mentioned the incubator. So you kind of came up here, you joined an incubator. And then from that incubator, tell us kind of how you came up with this, this uh, creative solution, the creative medical solution that you have, Crimson. Yeah, totally. So I uh, really started in our capstone class um, originally. So our team of bioengineers, we wanted to make a difference in nursing because of what we've seen through our family members in the nursing industry. It's just a rough working condition right now. We started a little bit before COVID. Um, so COVID really exposed a lot of the harsh working conditions that nurses are in, but that was really how we how we got started is in the capstone class. We sent out some surveys to the nurses that we knew, which is how we land on the problem that we did now. And so I'll kind of, you know, happy to go into the details of that problem that we're solving on our solution. But then we got some money from a business plan competition originally. So true kind of student entrepreneurs and student team, and then joined an incubator program through it's called SP3 Northwest up in here in Spokane. They've been really awesome to us, been amazing for mentorship and uh, helping us kind of grow up from student entrepreneurs to true entrepreneurs. And so, yeah. I like it. No, you, you mentioned you, you, your team during the capstone, you basically sought out and you're looking at a problem that you're trying to find a solution and then you found a solution. So first take us through that process. Take a, take the listeners through the process of what did you go through to kind of find out what this problem was, right? How did you find the problem? Who, who was your, who was your kind of focus on? And then lastly, what was the solution? Yeah. So we just essentially sent out surveys to a bunch of the nurses that we knew um, to, you know, what things are outdated? What are you, what issues are you running into day to day? Um, and what came up was IV line spaghetti. So for a variety of reasons, we chose IV line spaghetti um, because we figured we could make a solution, make a 3D printed solution in our capstone class, but it really took off. So the problem that we're addressing in IV line spaghetti is um, it's in the critical care space. So when you're when nurses are taking care of the most sick of possible patients, um, they get really complicated IV lines. Those patients can have 10 or more IV lines in place running at the same time, which seems like a lot. But, you know, if you take an example of um, someone who has sepsis, so their, their blood is infected and they're having multiple organ failure uh, or multiple organ dysfunction. I'm also non-clinical. So all of this oh, stuff good. is kind of learned through the, the nurses that we work with. But that patient can have um, an antibiotic running. They can have calcium, magnesium, potassium, a saline line for hydration, TPN for nutrition. Um, a opioid for the pain, a sedative to keep them sleep, you know, the list kind of goes on, right? So all of a sudden you have a ton of these drips that this patient needs to stay alive. Um, and you only have so many access points in the body to be running these drips in. And you add in that not all these drips are compatible. So if you have incompatible drips running together into those access points, you could really easily kill a patient. So 
errors come up because of these IV lines pretty often if you're not responsible in managing them. And the tools that hospitals provide to these nurses are tape, labels, your you know household stuff for managing these really complex environment. That's why it's called IV line spaghetti. So that's really the, the extent of the problem that you're dealing with. And so what we make is a really simple solution. A lot of people call it Legos for IV lines. And we simply combine the step of labeling the lines with organizational tools. So you have color coding for the lines and you connect, connect them together in parallel to avoid the tangling. So it's just kind of taking a lot of the things that nurses normally do to manage their lines and making it a lot formal. Because you also take shift changes, right? So you have a patient that's in that environment for more than one day. They're going to be seeing a new nurse every single shift. So how one nurse manages their lines might be slightly different than the next one. So there's just, I mean, there's, there's, it gets really complex, even this one simple issue in nursing. So our, our solution just goes to make that one thing a little bit easier. Yeah. And, and for the listeners, if, if you've ever been in kind of the healthcare setting, or if you've even watched, you know, any type of show like a ER or, you know, some type of Grey's Anatomy, you will see, you know, individuals with those large pumps behind their beds. Now those pumps, you know, what, what, um, you know, Stephen has mentioned is, is the, the drips, right? So these pumps basically are timers and each one of them have a different kind of timer and a different frequency and a different dosage that's actually dripping down through the IVs into these patients on a continuous basis. Because again, uh, these are patients that like, probably in the ICU, right? They have, they're very sedated. They, they, they're not eating, right? Cause they're sedated. They're, they're unconscious, right? They're, they're out. Uh, and so having to provide this nutrition, like he was mentioned as well, that all this, you know, different variations of, of proteins uh, is important as well to keep these patients going and it gets messy. I'm going to tell you folks, because you have IV lines and then you have oxygen lines and then you have, maybe have the chest tube. I mean, there's a lot of things They might have a drainage, right? For a Foley cath. Uh, there's just a lot of things yeah. that, uh, tend to get, you know, muddled in there. And so what really the solution is, and I hope folks are, the folks that are watching on uh, YouTube or folks that are going to subscribe to the newsletter, I'll have this so you can kind of visualize it, but it truly yeah. is like a Lego. It really is kind of a Lego. Now, how did you guys come up with this? I mean, a, a super innovative, really smart idea. How did you come up with it? Thanks. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so definitely check out the visual because it's highly visual on, on what it looks like. It's on our website and I'm sure, you know, you'll link that, all of that. But how we came up with it was, um, you know, taking a look at the issue. We really looked at like, why aren't other solutions out there? We were pretty surprised that it's tape and labels. When I talk to ICU managers today and ask them how their nurses manage the lines, I keep expecting to see something different than what we've seen. But every time it's just tape labels and yeah, so what we looked at why the current solutions weren't, we had kind of asked why current solutions out there weren't being adopted and mainly used. And the big thing comes back to workflow. Um, nurses generally, like their workflow is very important to them. They really care about patient care, um, but they're not gonna put something into their workflow that is going to disrupt it if it's only making a, a minor change. So our biggest focus was how do we fit into the workflow? And it was, combining labeling with the organization. And really we were just like 3D printing pieces initially. Um, that was another reason we landed on what we were doing. We were thinking like, maybe we could put some magnets in there. We could do like a reusable organizer with like magnets that connect them together. Or it was really just kind of brainstorming, but we had this really, really cool opportunity to work with a critical access hospital um, near our university really early on where we were working with real nurses, real patients, critical access hospitals, aren't the exact setting for what we're doing. They don't, they're patients that are really critical. They will transport them to larger hospitals. So not the exact setting, but to be able to work with real IV lines, real nurses, we're able to work with them and develop and change our product to make it work early on through 3D printing. You know, one of the things you mentioned is this whole entire uh, entrepreneurial endeavor started through the capstone, right? Through working through your organization, so a uh, university. So take us through that process. Uh, I want to kind of hear like how valuable was that capstone? Because I think you're the first guest that I think I've had on that actually was truly able to go from capstone. So folks that are maybe are unaware what capstone is, it's kind of your, your senior thesis, right? From a business perspective, you get together with a group of people and you basically create a business, right? And then you go and pitch that business to your teachers uh, and they kind of usually vote on saying like, you know, what's better. And sometimes you're able to take that idea 
and do exactly what's happening here and scale it into a viable business. So take us through your kind of capstone process. Um, how did that kind of go? And then how important and valuable was it to you kind of getting to where you're at today? Yeah. So student entrepreneurship is so interesting now that I'm looking back on it because you take these, like the students, like as we are and how I'm, I'm just so early in what I'm doing, like so green as an entrepreneur. So I'm always looking to constantly like learn and improve myself. That's kind of a really big theme for what I'm doing now. But, you know, as students, and I love working with students at the university that I, you know, came out of and any other student entrepreneurs, because you, you really haven't been out there and had a job and been in the professional world. And then all of a sudden you're starting a company. So it's just kind of this really, really bizarre thing. And you have a lot of things against you, but in the capstone, you know, getting connected with those mentors, professors and the program, you know, it's just kind of getting that help to get off the ground. Um, but yeah, the main thing was going through the programs was the most beneficial. So doing the business plan competition, going through i which is a NSF funded program where you really focus on your customers. So that's something that was really important to learn. And yeah. And you know, you you mentioned that you're, you're really green. This is, this is all new, right? What are what are some of the aspects that you've have found relatively either easy or enjoyable during the early stages of your entrepreneurial journey? Hmm. Easy and enjoyable. I don't know. A lot of a lot of it's really really hard, but um, I really like working with the team and and working with customers. And I would say one of the biggest mistakes that we made was focusing a little too much on. Uh, like business plan competitions as a metric for success early on, you know, those were really, really valuable, but we weren't focused enough on reaching our customers. And so when we went out to do initial fundraising um, a few years in after, or, you know, a year into moving up Spokane and, and doing this, their main feedback was make sure you know how to reach your customer and, and get in with them because that's the most important part. So early on working with that initial hospital on the, you know, developing our product and working with the nurses, that was probably the most enjoyable part. So for us, that customer is pretty accessible, but for other companies and entrepreneurs, especially if they're B2C, working with customers is just really, really fun. You know, I'm going to come back to that because I want to, I want to ask how you do reach your, in fact, you do reach your customers. But one of the things you mentioned too, is like, you know, some of this things is actually really hard, this entrepreneurship. So what are, what are some of the most challenging things that you've encountered as being an entrepreneur? Yeah, uh, I think just being really humble um, it is hard. So accepting feedback and uh, pretty early on, I, I learned that anytime that I'm improving myself, it's improving the company because as an early stage company, especially as a student entrepreneur, the more, uh, you know, I, our, our team members are our biggest assets at that time. So self-development being really, really important and getting feedback because there were a lot of times where I thought we were doing such an amazing job and moving forward. And then you have someone who's done it before that comes in and goes, you're actually doing all of these things wrong and you need to completely change the course of what you're doing. So kind of going back to that, like when we initially went out to do fundraising in 2021, that mean feedback was like, how do you reach your customers? You know, like, and we were planning to go, you know, slightly kind of somewhat outsource that process. And, and they were like, you need to take that in house and you need to learn how to do it yourself. And kind of like, what are you doing? So those conversations are really, really hard when you get feedback from people that you really respect that you go, wow, you know what, you're right. And you're swallowing this hard to swallow pill that's inevitably going to help you out in the future. And I would say the one thing, one of the biggest mistakes that, that we've made is, and the advice I've gotten recently is, it's a lot easier to do this kind of thing if you have someone on the team that's done it before. So we have moved a lot slower than we possibly could have if we we took that route. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. You know, it's kind of like that learning curve, right? You're, like you mentioned, you're, you're, you're not clinical you're starting to learn a whole new medical jargon that is all brand new and then because you do have to go into these sales pitch meetings uh you kind of have to fake it till you make it right you kind of have to put on the persona that you do in fact are very knowledgeable about this thing i always tell folks uh if you want us found really smart tell me explain something to me that a way a kindergarten can know it 
then I know you know it. Like if you can explain something to me the way a kindergarten will be able to understand it, then I know you know all of your information. Now, one of the things you also mentioned was, you know, building the brand, right? You you said you had access to, first, let's kind of talk about a little bit how having access to that critical care hospital early on in your career was very beneficial. And then let's talk about how do you reach your customers now? Yeah, so that's been difficult because we essentially went from not doing any sales. I, I did some initial sales like back in, in high school. I sold Cutco knives, which was <laughs> a great experience uh, for me. I did pretty well. I actually broke our fast start record, uh, which it. is the first amount of sales in your first 10 days of selling. So I have a little bit of a sales background in, in that, pretty limited. But then on the other side, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you essentially have to have someone on the team that's doing the sales at, at any point. And that's not something we really leaned into initially. So at a certain point, I took on this sales responsibility within the company and we're selling to hospitals, which is not only B2B sales, it's like very complex, highly regulated B2B sales. So in terms of how we reach our customers so far, it's just been like networking and, and knowing people has been really the easiest way is if we can get an introduction to the right person, then that's really the easiest way to do it. But long-term, we're still figuring out that process of how do we reach someone without that kind of non-scalable networking component. So that's through independent sales reps, like contracted reps going through distribution, um, you know, doing like LinkedIn, email, call. So we're still kind of operationaling that, operationalizing that on that side. But even from the beginning, we didn't even know something that we we thought was, oh, you know, this process is kind of like known, like how to sell this product is known. It's somewhere out there that we can discover. But what we figured out is we had to kind of discover it our, ourselves. So had to learn who really cares about IB line organization for us. And what we end up learning is that our influencers for this model are nursing leadership and patient safety leadership at a hospital. Our customer is the ICU manager and our users are ICU nurses. And for a long time, we didn't even focus in on IC, the ICU, which was a big misunderstanding for the market that we had. So it's been a long process of, of learning exactly how we do this and, and we have the basic structure together, but we're still learning a lot, even though we've started this initial trial, um, because as we go and scale long-term, it's going to be scaling the sales process. So it has to be a lot faster. Yeah, and what, you know, I think uh, one of the things you know, listeners can take away is you, you really do have to humble yourself when you're going into a new product development because, like you mentioned, hey, you guys were one targeting the incorrect people at one time or the incorrect yeah. market, two creating the wrong product right uh, at first, and then like, are we really kind of thriving? And and you know, one thing I would recommend, you know, one of the things that medical professionals really find valuable is if you can figure out a way. There's two things. Conferences, attending conferences and being able to provide some type of educational lecture and actually have a CE attached to it. So you can actually, let's say, for example, look, work with some of your clients, get a case study or two and actually create a lecture around that, a one 45 minute lecture, an hour lecture. Now, you're not necessarily branding your stuff, right? Because you you have to be unbiased when you're doing educational lectures. However, you can talk about how, you know, during the case studies, how your product benefited the patients, right? And it's in a very organic way. You're getting a C credit, and then you're able there kind of to talk about your product. And you have champions. Usually, you probably have a nurse probably do that lecture with you. The value right there is is the education piece, right? The the C credit, but then you're also talking about your brand organically. Yeah, totally. I actually went to. I recently went to a the the critical care uh, organization specific to the Inland Northwest. I actually had a talk where it was sponsored by. I believe it was striker but then they had a nurse expert just come in and talk about the process and they didn't even they didn't even plug their product so it's the yep. type of thing where exactly we were talking about like continue education credits sponsored by striker they have products that surrounded the, the topic of everything but they legitimately brought in a nursing expert to do the whole talk and so it's just a value add with their name attached to it so those are the type of things we really want to grow into and another struggle has been you know, bootstrapping, like, how do we have enough, like, where do we put our resources to that? And so the next stage of things, after we have these initial sales, it's going to be starting to do those. How, how do we get our name out there for conferences, CE credits? Yeah, really excited to grow into those things. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things you mentioned too, and I think it's very important that the listener really understand this is like identifying the right target market. Uh, I was actually speaking with a company recently, they're creating, you know, a software, not going to say anything about it, but they're, in my perception, they're, they're focusing on the wrong target market. Uh, they, you know, I asked them like, Hey, I can help you with this and do this. Uh, Cause I am the, in fact, the right target market. Like actually we're speaking with providers that the providers are going to help us. I'm like, your provider's never going to touch this. Never. They will never touch yeah. this, but I get it. I get, I get the uh, belief that they might, but at the end of the day, the providers, if you're not, if it's not a CR, if it's not an Epic, if it's not like an actual medical records system, the likelihood of providers going to touch it is very slim, right? Or, or a physical product. If it's a physical product, sure. But a uh, software, I mean, at, outside of Epic, to be honest with you, it, it, they don't have time for anything else. An email, Epic and email, that's about it. So uh, just just letting you guys know out there that are folks that are targeting certain folks in the in the healthcare industry. Now, what would you say, you know, again, you're you're still kind of building. What, what's your goal? What is the plan for the next, you know, iteration? Where, where do you guys see yourself in five, 10 years? Yeah, good, good question. And real quick, so for a little bit more on the target market, and I'll get into kind of next stages of things. One of our initial meetings with was an ICU manager and an emergency room manager. And the ICU manager goes, yeah, this would be great. We organize our lines. And the, the emergency room manager goes, there's no way my nurses are ever going to use something like this because that's just way different in the culture. So we time. validated where our product would be, which is the high acuity inpatient setting and where it wouldn't be really early on. And we didn't even listen to that. So we spent way too much time focusing effort away from the ICU even though we figured that out so early on. So that's just been a big frustration of me. Like there's so many things I'm frustrated with my past self on not making those learnings. So, and it's also like, uh, like finding the right person. When we talk to intensivists, like ICU docs, this absolutely does not land at all because they're not managing the lines. They see it and, and some understand it, but there's just people out there that will understand and care about what we're doing and, and people that absolutely won't. So it's been really interesting to learn. That's but, a great call out. That's a great call out. Yeah. So in terms of next steps, uh, you know, this trial, we've been working on getting this trial for the last two years. And so I am just super excited about this milestone. And this is a really fun time for us right now. And uh, once they purchase, we have some other hospitals within their system that are interested in trialing it next. So we have somewhat of a pipeline built out after this initial trial. Um, but the next six to 12 months is going to be operationalizing the things that we're doing to be preparing for a seed round of investment. So making sure that we know exactly how to run these trials, um, exactly how to get these trials, those numbers and all of that to be able to put some money into it to scale it up. Um, and then from there, it's going to be about a few years of, of scaling that process. But we also expect to be acquired pretty early because in the medical device space, you have really simple products like this. There's some other examples of simple products out there that fit really, really well into larger companies' portfolios where getting acquired and partnering with those companies that have similar missions, work with similar customers is the type of trend that usually happens for companies like ours. There's not a lot of like independent product companies out there in the healthcare space. So about three years out um, is where we're looking to, you know, see an acquisition like that, but it's not something that we're specifically targeting at a timeline. We're all, there's also a few other products that we'd like to get started in this space. You know, the whole goal is get this one product out there, but there are a few other things within the same vein of patient safety, improved workflow, um, you know, high reliability, high visualization of what's going on in healthcare that we might branch into once we're scaling the sales process of, of this. So, so that's another potential avenue as well. I like it. And I got I got to point out the, the awesome choice of words. Going to choose another vein. I like that. This is unintentionally, <laughs> unintentionally healthcare comedy right there. Now, no, I really do love it. And I think it's, I, I truly believe that your company will in fact get purchased, you know, acquired pretty early on uh, because there are a lot of, there one, there's a lot of limited innovation in the medical field uh, outside of true healthcare devices. And I'm talking like, you know, heart care devices and things of that nature. Uh, there really is limited in this. I think 
once you now folks I, the importance of the clinical trial i i the fact that you have one you're going to get one going is so huge because i do believe it's going to show there's some benefits and when it shows benefits to patient care now hospital operations are like oh yeah we have benefits for patient care we're going to lower length of stay we're going to be able to care for our patients even better bring it on like we will will happily spend money to help our patients get cared for better right and so this is, I truly believe that this is a product that probably will help that, all right? And I think the clinical trial will in fact show that. And so I'm really excited for you because I really think that the seed round is gonna, I'm really excited. In fact, I would love for you guys to come back, you know, after your seed round to kind of say, hey, how did that go? You know, because I think you're still drinking from the yeah. fire hose, still figuring it out. And uh, I feel like I'm kind of very fortunate to be part of it in the very early stages of being able, because we've, we've talked before, right? This is, mm -hmm. we talked a couple of, I think maybe a month or two ago uh, about the product talking about you know just business advice uh what where we can go people i can connect you with right in my own community right and then it kind of transitioned into hey let's get you on the podcast as well to continue to build now with that said right because you kind of called and it's like hey gabriel how can i get some advice about what we're doing in the healthcare world steven give, gives us some folks that are listening some advice about entrepreneurship things that you've learned that you're glad you've went through in the last couple of years that you kind of glad you went through because you made it today. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, this is an interesting question because this is, I mean, this is a, what I, I ask for advice for, for all the time from people right now. So still, still learning a ton, but I would say that a, a big learning is that people want to help you. So, you know, for example, in the conversation we had, you know, found you reached out, asked for advice around and entrepreneurship, people are happy to give that kind of help. Um, if, if you're not over asking for it. So I think that's been a big learning is, is people, want to help you out um, and getting your name out there. You know, it's not necessarily super easy to get those conversations. Um, but if you reach out to people um, a lot, then then you'll find people that want to help you. And I would just say continually learning is really, really important. So dedicating some time to uh, reading books and developing yourself is really important. I'm, I'm big about routines, self-improvement and, and and those kind of things. So you know, two things you mentioned is, is, you know, finding help, right. And, and asking, and there's people out there that are willing to help you. Tell me about your experience with the incubator, because you, you mentioned after your capstone, right. You went through your capstone and then you went through the, a business incubator. Talk about, tell folks a little bit about what a business incubator is and your experience going through it. Yeah. So business incubator is essentially connecting you with resources and mentors to get your business to the next stage. Um, Michelle Armstrong is one of the main people over at SB3 Northwest, and she's actually from the Portland area. So she's has she was previously in in their kind of business entrepreneurship incubator stuff over there. So she's been able to make some connections over in Portland. But you know, examples of things that we've been connected to through our incubator are an FDA consultant who walked us through exactly how we do our FDA. They provided us with resources. They provided us with advisors. The clinical trial that we're doing, and it's not really, it's more of a pilot, not necessarily a clinical trial because it's not like 510K or, yeah, long story short, it's just, it's kind of more, it's more of a trial, less so a clinical trial. But that chief nursing officer that we were able to connect with for that was a connection through our incubator, which is our, our most valuable thing that we've done to date is getting this trial started. So it's been invaluable connections and there's just been countless other connections that they've made that have turned into another connection, another connection where I'm sure, you know, if I traced everything back, there are so many things that I've gained from being in that kind of program. And there's a lot of programs like that. So we've really focused on making sure that we're doing as many business plan competitions as we can, getting to as many programs that we can, um, that we can handle to, to get help essentially. So. Yeah. And, and folks, if, you know, the reason I was asking about business accelerator, we created our own business accelerator program here in Oregon called Latino founders. So folks that may be unaware, Latino founders is a 501 C three nonprofit organization. We're a business accelerator as well as a pitch competition. So it's a 12 week business accelerator. We're bringing in different uh, entrepreneurs and they go through various processes. We talk about product market fit. We talk about scaling we talk about operations, right? We make, we build a lot of connections. We build them either with venture capitalists or bankers, or you want to 
actually talk with an actual mentor, like you mentioned as well. Uh, and the goal is really to kind of create this uh, entrepreneurial community within our own Portland ecosystem because our, our economy is hurting, right? Our community is also hurting. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to help establish generational wealth, right? Our goal for Latino founders is to help 100 Latinos within five years. So that's 20 Latinos a year generate a million dollars in reoccurring revenue for their business. So we truly want to actually scale them. And how are we doing that, right? Well, as, as Stephen mentioned, going through a business accelerator program is one way we help them, right? Get them connected with mentors, get them connected with lawyers, FDA, uh, trademarks, uh, you know, you name it, going down that line. And then also the pitch competition. So we give them an opportunity, a platform to pitch their idea to community members and venture capitalists that are able to attend, pitch their idea and like now, now we actually give out funding and these are, these are grants. So you don't have to pay us back. They're, they're fully on you. You're, you're giving to them free and clear. We gave out over $35,000 last year, I believe it was. Wow. And, and we're going to continue to do this uh, here in the state of Oregon to really build a community that is self-sustaining, right? Because again, the, the U S economy is built on the backs of small business owners. And so how can we continue to create that synergy, uh, amongst, uh, our, not only our, our Latino community, but also the entrepreneurs just in, within our state, you know, the food and beverage is also one. If you look across altitude beverage is a former, uh, former business accelerator program that was with us, um, bottles recently just opened their own brick and mortar because they won a $10,000 pitch Latino grant. And they were able to own their brick and mortar, and now they're continuing to grow. Uh, so you're starting to see, uh, you know, the Synergy Ballroom, which is going to be an app that I think will really be very innovative that's going to be coming out. Uh, uh, again, there's a lot of cool things that are happening in the community. It's just kind of getting out there, right? Now, what, what you mentioned, you know, the the biggest thing is is you, you talk about networking. How important has networking been to you? Uh, absolutely essential. I Like every like, big opportunity that we've, set up has, has been through networking, which a lot of pieces of that are, you know, asking for meetings with people and then asking for more connections from them. So it can be really hard to say, hey, who can you connect me with? Um, but when you ask people for specific connections to specific people, it makes it easier on them. And just having that ask is really important. And I was going to say like that competition and that program that you, that you have, anybody who qualifies for that, they definitely go out there and apply for them. Business plan competitions and accelerators are so valuable. In, in terms of just feedback, we've had a lot of competitions. I just got denied into a finals for a business plan competition. We got to the semifinals of uh, the MIT Sloan Healthcare Innovation oh, wow. Challenge, something like that. We did like, which is interesting because when we go to these kind of competitions, we're like Legos for IV lines. And there's a lot of other people that are like AI, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's an, we're an interesting category in this space, but we just kind of trust the process. We go in, we do our best. But so we just didn't get into the finals, but we got a ton of feedback. From being involved in that program so we actively are still looking for programs looking for competitions to be able to get some more money get some more feedback get connected because when you're in those programs those people are really open to help you out going forward so yeah but yeah networking you know making the ask uh, i think the biggest lesson i've learned around networking is uh, making it easy for the person to help you will increase your productivity so for us when we're talking to somebody that, you know, could connect us with chief nursing officers, patient safety leaders, ICU managers, making that really specific and saying, hey, can I, can you connect to me with these people so I can talk to them about X? Um, just making your ask more specific is a lot easier. I remember back in college when I was like, yeah, I'm looking for a bioengineering internship. And I'm just like laughing at myself, making that ask to people because it was so broad and unspecific. There's no way anybody could help me. Whereas if Back at that time, I had asked for uh, looking for specific internships in specific fields. And this is just a really specific, like, you know, back question around networking that I know I messed up on, but making a, making your ask more specific and easier for people to help you out makes networking a lot more efficient. Yeah. And, you know, I, I agree, like, uh, one, the, the power of networking is huge. And, and I think, yes, folks, you are going to probably see a lot of like AI innovative, you know, entrepreneur, but at the end of the day, Product development is still, there's still a lot of behind product development, physical products, right? Uh, 
Steven's showing you one right here uh, with with their product, uh, with the Crimson Medical Solution. I think it's it's really something that is innovative and it's simple uh, because I think it's going to create a lot more patient safety uh, in an area where patient safety is imperative because again these are individuals are usually in the ICU as you mentioned. Um, and so I, I think I think it's something that's going to be very important. And then again, going back to the networking thing, folks, uh, if if you're listening, anybody that has a business accelerator program. I'm happy to connect with you because I'm also trying to learn. Uh, I also want to learn how you guys became like the MIT Sloan. I, I, I reached out to those folks. Um, I know one gentleman actually that went through one over in New York. I'm like, hey, let me know how I can, uh, you know, how I can help because I want to learn how you guys have been successful so we can try to be successful here in our community. You know, I, I just want to share the knowledge. I hope this podcast for those listening is also a knowledge share uh, for those because, again, my goal is to really provide some very valuable, valuable information. Now, Stephen, for folks that are interested in learning more about you, maybe find out some more valuable information, how do they contact with you, website, socials, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, easiest way would be over LinkedIn. Um, I'm most active on LinkedIn. I'm not really active or I don't really go on any other social medias consistently. Um, so the best way would be through LinkedIn or email. And my email is, is on my LinkedIn um, or through our website for Crimson Medical Solutions or our LinkedIn page for Crimson Medical Solutions. Perfect. And folks, if you forget all of that information, this is a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. You can subscribe at the shades of e.com. We'll have all this information on the newsletter. You can also visit, as I mentioned, the shades of e.com, or you can visit our social sites at the shades of e, LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, and uh, Instagram. So go ahead and follow those. And you can also stream this on YouTube. For those that want early access, you can become a Patreon member for $5 a month. And you can actually get this video for, uh, usually a week before it airs. Uh, now, Steven, is there anything else you'd like to say before we uh, let the guests go? Um, well, I would just say, you know, if there are student out, entrepreneurs out there listening, I would just say, like, keep going at it. It's a really cool journey. Um, I I love the things I get to do, you know, every time I'm like running this, this trial, never something that I would expected that I would be able to do, or, you know, uh, negotiating with manufacturers or, you know, being on a podcast or these are really, really cool opportunities. And so it can be really, really difficult on the early stages of doing entrepreneurship early on, especially right out of college, but it's definitely worth it. And it's definitely a lot of fun. Um, and I'm, I'm excited for where this takes me. I love it. And you get to meet new people every day, like every, every day. day, every day, somebody new. I love it. Steven, thank you so much again for your time. Again, folks, that's Crimson Medical Solution. Uh, to find out more, please visit the shades of e.com and we'll have information on the website. You can also visit it on uh, the, follow us on the shades of e on TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, Facebook. Please uh, follow us on subscribe on YouTube. Thank you and have a great night.